doing something a little differently this year. We have three distinguished guests, and they're here to participate in a little panel discussion about practical applications of what it means to love boldly. So let me introduce them to you. Megan Meisler is the one in the middle. Are you, are you clapping because I got that right? Is that, okay. She's a licensed clinical social worker and a DCE, Director of Christian Education in the Missouri Synod. Currently the Associate Director at Lutheran Counseling Services in Florida. She started the school counseling ministry at Lutheran Counseling Services where she works with interns in the mental health field to meet the needs of students, faculty, staff in private schools in the Orlando area. She's worked in disaster response within organizations, schools, congregations in North Dakota, Virginia, Louisiana, and Florida. She specializes in counseling children, couples, families. Welcome, Megan. <laughs> to Megan's left is Reverend Tim Carter. He, here, here's what the bio says. He endured a lengthy career in the prison system, actually becoming a product of the prison environment and turning into a hostile and violent person. Over time, God transformed Tim's heart and shaped him to love boldly within a culture of violence and regular executions. Reverend Carter is now serving as life pastor at Salem Lutheran Church, Tomball, Texas. Welcome, Reverend Carter. And to Megan's right is Reverend David Schilling, the former U.S. Navy chaplain for the Missouri Synod. Reverend Schilling says that whether on deployment to the combat zone, sharing hardship with troops in the field, or simply caring for military families in garrison, he had the best job in the military for 20 years. As a commander, he also served with the Navy, Marine Corps, and Canadian forces. And in August, accepted a call to serve as senior pastor of Zion Lutheran Church in Brighton, Colorado. Welcome. Thank you. Reverend Schilling. Thank you. So here, here's our format. Each of our guests is going to spend about 10 minutes talking about their ministry. And at that, after that's complete, we will direct some questions to them. So at this point, we're going to ask Megan Meisler to begin. Okay. Well, thank you so much for having me. Um, it's a joy to be here. I often describe myself or have been described as a fixer or a problem solver. How many of you maybe hold that title in the work that you do? You like to solve problems or fix things. Um, in fact, my dad would often joke in my dating life um, that I would bring home these projects, uh, <laughs> these boys that I could fix or save. And so I am married. I have a wonderful husband and three beautiful children. But this idea of fixing things or problem solving reigns really supreme in my life. And I find that it really prevents me from loving boldly. Because when I'm trying to fix or solve things, it ends up being a lot more about me than about the people that I'm trying to love. So as they said, I am a licensed clinical social worker. I am also a rostered DCE. And I love our DCE community. I don't know if there's any here, but I always give them a big pat on the back for the work that they do. My current role is the Associate Director at Lutheran Counseling Services. And my joy is to work with adolescents and teens and families. In the private practice setting, I do a lot of work with families and teens. But as a DCE, I served in a school ministry. And that's really where I found my joy to serve students and most of all teachers and staff and love on them and the people that they serve. So when I moved to Lutheran Counseling Services, I started a school counseling ministry. 
and we place interns, registered interns in the mental health field in seven private schools in the Orlando area. And what we're finding is that people coming out of secular schools, getting mental health degrees, have no experience in working with spiritual issues in the counseling setting. And so that's our goal, to raise up mental health professionals to be able to work on spiritual issues in the counseling setting. But my interns continue to run into this problem of fixing things, of problem solving. And even the clients that enter my office, sometimes in crisis, want their problem solved. Or, more often than not, they just want their kid fixed. So this idea of problem solving really runs into a lot of the work that we do. We hear things like this. A teacher, could you please come into my classroom and do a presentation on friendship? These third grade girls are crying every day and I need it to stop. Or a mom, we can't get homework done without any tears at night. I'm done with the tantrums. Can you please bring me peace in my house? Or more recently, a dad. Can you just find the magic button? He thinks he's gay, but if you find the magic button, we could just reset all of this and start over. But we are not in the job of fixing things. And I did not become a counselor to fix people. Dan Siegel, in his book, Mindsight, gives this analogy of our life as a river, and we are in the canoe. <clears throat> So our life is a river, and we're in the canoe. We're in Florida, so we have canoes a lot, and we ride around rivers. And the idea is, is that you're steering your canoe down the river, and you're trying to stay away from the rocky edges, and you're dodging the boulders and the sticks in the middle of the river. And sometimes it becomes overwhelming, and you need somebody to jump in the canoe with you, not to take over, not to steer, not to kick you out of your own canoe, just to be present with you, just to ride with you. Every day in the work I do, I see abuse, violence in our city of Orlando. We've had so much violence. Anxiety, so much anxiety. Suicide, self-harm, and the list can go on and on. And I work really hard to just be present, to listen, to understand where they've come from, where they want to get to that's often very different than where I want them to get to, identify times of strength, help them see people in their lives as support, but more often than not, just meet them, meet them right where they're at. I'm not fixing, I'm work walking beside them, and helping them become aware of who they are, who God wants them to be. Sam is a sixth grade boy that I've been working with for about two years. He's brilliant, the kind of brilliant that's intimidating to his friends. He loves video games, asking random questions, and he really is an excellent artist. At times, he's seen as disrespectful, because he doesn't want to do schoolwork that he finds pointless. Mostly multiplying fractions. Although LCEF, I'm, I'm sure you could teach him that that's very beneficial. When he enters my office, he's often picking at his hair and his mom will grab his hand and pull it away because it embarrasses her. Sam has been diagnosed with ADHD and he's tested with an IQ of 140. He's quiet. You will often find him over-focused on things and withdrawn in a setting of friends because he just wants to go off, play his video games, and be by himself. Sam and I have talked about many things. His favorite is Pokemon. So I'm all up on my Pokemon language. Through our work, Sam began to understand what anxiety is, what it feels like in his body, how much it bothers his parents, why he often escapes, and how that makes other people feel when he just gets up and walks away. 
Sam is still anxious after the two years I've worked with him. We have not fixed that. He still becomes over-focused on things and withdraws, but he's aware of who he is, he knows what's going on inside of him, and he has tools now and words to say when that need to escape a crowd comes over him. God has given Sam a brilliant mind, and he is gonna do great things. But he's a sixth grade boy, mm. so he cannot see that yet or understand that. What he does know is that his anxiety can bother his parents and make him unapproachable and have difficulty in social settings. So he's learning and he's growing in his schoolwork and he's slowly becoming more and more aware of who he is and why God has placed him in this world. I'm so blessed to be able to work with Sam for these last two years. I know a lot of Pokemon, but I also know a lot about anxiety and how it distorts his thinking at times and makes him unapproachable. In the work that I do, loving boldly means that day after day, as an adult, an intern, a family, an adolescent or a child enters my office, I get to jump in the canoe mm. with them. I get to be present with them, walk alongside them, help them understand what's taking place in that canoe, what's going on within them, giving them skills to cope with their circumstance and helping them set goals for the future. For some, we are only in that canoe for a short while. And others, we get to ride together for a long time. I encourage you to meet people where they are at. A lot of times it doesn't take any words. We don't have to say the right thing to the person that's grieving or struggling. Our presence is all that is needed. And that desire to fix and that desire to problem solve within us, we just need to be aware of and how it affects us being able to love people boldly. So get in the canoe with people. That's my message to you. Don't steer, uh -huh. don't take over, but just listen. Thank you. Thank you, Megan. Reverend Schilling, from your military career, could you share what it means to love boldly? I sit here this morning as a former military chaplain. I retired officially on New Year's Eve before I accepted, received and accepted a call. But really, I represent the 57 active duty military chaplains that are sent by the LCMS, as well as the 101 reserve chaplains, National Guard chaplains, and Civil Air Patrol chaplains. And while my stories are unique, they are but a sample of the encounters that are experienced by so many of us chaplains. We wear the uniform, but we remain a pastor. We never carry a weapon, and yet we wield the most powerful weapon that any human could wield when we apply the word of God in difficult situations and proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. We go wherever our troops go, from training in the safe backwoods to the combat zones in Afghanistan or across vast empty spaces of ocean to the next strategic point. We do whatever our troops do, from physical training at zero dark early to eating that MRE and sitting on the frozen ground to do it, or grabbing up all your gear, throwing it on your back, and hiking to the next pause, no matter how far that is. We make visits to forward operating bases. We officiate at dignified transfers of fallen heroes. And all the while, we're providing care. We're taking care of our troops and their families, whether we're at home or whether we are deployed. In retrospect, over the last 20 years, I see how the Holy Spirit had so many occasions put me in the right place at the right time for his purposes. 
being with my unit in good times and bad times won their confidence. I became a keeper of secrets and the patron saint of those in the panic mode. Sometimes Bible studies led to baptisms. Sometimes giving guys a ride to church on Sunday morning led to instruction and confirmation. And throughout it all, I did a lot of counseling. And just when I thought I had heard every story or every situation there could possibly be, somebody would come up with a sincere question, and I'd be sitting there thinking, if I didn't have confidentiality, this would make the most hilarious story in a book. Sometimes loving boldly meant talking guys out of bad ideas. I have probably talked guys out of getting married more often than I have officiated <laughs> at marriages. And there were a few who ignored my advice and got married anyway. And then they came to me later after the divorce papers were filed and said, chaps, I should have listened to you. I recall many who came to me in their fear, fear because of ideas they had in their head, fears of self-harm and suicide. And I think back to all those who either I was able to help or I else I took them to get help. But I'll never forget the few who never gave me that opportunity except to officiate at their memorial services. When you serve so many, for many 800 in one unit, 1,200 in the next, 4,000 on a large ship, and even more than that when I was in positions where I was covering down for other units because chaplain billets were gapped. That meant they were going empty. I realized how important it was for me to get to know every one of them that I could know. And your one encounter may be the only chance for that one-on-one -on -one attention. So I'd look in the eyes, those young eyes, and I'd pray, God, let this be the one that's spared. And then when a tragedy did happen, you'd rack your brain trying to remember that encounter, trying to remember the face, maybe a story that was shared, what their background was, anything you could have gleaned from that chance encounter. When notification of a death needs to be made, it's the chaplain who's on that team, that dreaded team, where you put on the dress uniforms and you go find the home of the next of kin. And whenever that untimely duty came up, it usually also meant for me preparing that young officer for his first ever casualty call. The worst of the worst? I'd say it was the call where I held the infant of a Marine who had died in Iraq as we told his wife that she was not a widow and a single parent. And as I held that child, she told me that he had deployed before the baby was born. Mm. I tell you all this because I want to give you a picture of how important it was for me to know my troops. My assistant and I, and I have many assistants over the course of 20 years, but we always realized that we had a rare opportunity to gather information to get to know him or her in that moment. Maybe they were just checking into our office. Maybe we were visiting their workplace. And after the initial question of where is home home, and I say that deliberately because home home in military speak is asking them, where did you grow up? I would slip in the question then, tell me about your religious background. Now that's an open-ended question because uh, those coming into, our United, into the armed forces come from all sorts of backgrounds. Some of them religious, some totally against religion. That's their rights as Americans. Some would let me know, well, sir, I'm not very religious. So I'd ask, well, have you ever visited a church? Did you ever go to Sunday school? And most had. And when they had, they would usually credit a grandparent who loved them boldly, or a neighbor who loved them boldly and brought them. You know, asking that same question so many times, you try to, you have your quick retorts and you have your icebreakers. And I would say something like, well, so Marine, tell me, what is your religious background? Do you have a church home? Are you religious? Silence, crickets. Oh, I know you're holding back. 
you're really a snake handler and you don't want me to know. <laughs> oh, no, sir, I'm not that. Oh, are you a shaker? What's a shaker, sir? Well, you dance around in a circle, you make really cool furniture, and you're celibate. <clears throat> celibate, what's that, sir? It means you never have sex. Oh, no, sir, I'm not a, I'm not a shaker. <laughs> not a shaker. <clears throat> I'll never forget the one who, after those questions, said, well, sir, I'm sort of Baptist. <laughs> and I pictured in his hometown the sign on the church saying, sort of Baptist. <laughs> My objective was to get them to start talking about God, to see that God was their best friend, and God did not stay at home. God was with them wherever they went and would continue to be wherever they were sent. When it comes to forgiveness of hope, no matter what the circumstances, we need to keep hearing how God loves us. And I was their unconditional love, their source of confidentiality to keep reminding them of that. When folks back home in the U.S. would boldly send us care packages and we would get to distribute them, I always wondered what those folks at home, how they pictured us. The ladies who uh, stopped at Starbucks and bought coffee to put in a care package to send us. Or that retiree who every hotel that he or she stayed in, they grabbed those little bottles of shampoo and lotion and conditioner and then they donated them for the care packages. What did they know of us? What about that teacher who had her students make the poster that arrived in the tube, and then we took it out of the tube and we hung it up in the chow hall or in the back of the field chapel? What did they know of what we did? Did they see me and my assistant in our battle gear riding for hours in an up-armored vehicle just to go visit a handful of Marines who were embedded with Afghan troops? Did they picture me consecrating the elements on Monday, Thursday in a tent in a very odd little camp in Afghanistan while dirigibles overhead with cameras kept watch? Did they have any idea that on Saturday evenings I was leading worship and that the contract workers from Sri Lanka and Kenya and Nepal and places like that outnumbered the troops who were in the seats. None of us can foresee how God may be using our whole life to put us in the right place at the right time to accomplish his purposes. You know, the great takeaway in the book of Esther, Esther 4.14, is that call to love boldly. Oh, it doesn't use those words, but that's what it's saying. To put our lives on the line when only our words and our actions and our situation can make a difference. The verse says, who knows whether you have not come to the kingdom, and I'll say Christ's kingdom, for such a time as this. For such a time as this, for a military chaplain, keeps happening over and over again. For such a time as this happens when you're summoned to the critical care unit, because one of your troop's children has fallen critically ill and they want their child baptized before the doctor pulls the plug on the life support. For such a time as this happens when you get the phone call and you throw on your uniform and you race across base because there's a house fire and they want you there to hold up the mother because they have found the child inside the house. Mm. For such a time as this happens over and over again, and many times great times, when the Holy Spirit breaks through and creates faith or puts the right question on a troop's heart and you're ready to answer it. At Camp Leatherneck in Helmand Province, Afghanistan, I was preparing for the memorial service of one of our canine handlers. This Marine had been out on patrol with a group and a sniper took his life from him. In the aftermath, I'd learned not only was this Marine an only child, but that his, his parents had loved him boldly and had sent him to Christian schools for all of his education, K through high school and a couple years of college, all Christian schools. 
And I knew that at the memorial, I would be preaching to generals and colonels and sergeant majors alongside many young Marines and sailors. So my chosen text was Proverbs 22, verse 6. Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. From all I learned, the parents of our fallen Marine had done just that. Boldly, they had loved their son. Boldly, they had invested in him, ensuring that he got a Christian education, ensuring that he knew Christ and that he would be with Christ no matter what. In every way, they had trained up their child in the way he should go. But this Marine we were more memorializing would not grow old. We would. All of us sitting in that plywood frame chapel in the desert of Afghanistan would likely grow old. So what would we do? What would we do with this life that the Lord is still giving us on earth? As we gather here today, we ask ourselves the same thing. It is an assumed fact that by our presence here, each one of us has been trained in the way we should go. For most of us, our parents took us to the baptismal font when we were infants. They dragged us to Sunday school. They made sure that we were prepared for confirmation. We are the results of parents and teachers and pastors. And most of us now are leaders in our congregations, fully supporting the work of Jesus Christ and the proclamation of his gospel in every way. We have been trained up in the way we should go. We follow a savior who loved us boldly. How will we continue to do the same? <clears throat> Thank you, David. Tim. Some of us have visited people in prison and are always happy to leave. You, that was your environment. So talk a little bit about that. What does it mean to love boldly within such a system? Um, it's a strange calling for anyone to love boldly in prison as in prison ministry. Uh, I, my hat is off to any of you. Uh, thank God for any of you that do any prison ministry. And I thank God for all of you that did the servant uh, event before uh, this conference started. Uh, I was a part of that and I was highly impressed. So I'm um, very thankful to LCEF for putting that up there. Uh, prison ministry appears to be uh, a calling that may be uh, one of the least uh, answered of all callings. And like you said, uh, I don't blame people. Uh, like you said, Max, uh, people that maybe go into a prison to visit are glad to leave. Uh, those walls are not big and uh, topped with uh, serpentine barbed wire for no reason. Mm. Uh, and some prison ministry people get hurt. Some get uh, manipulated. And so uh, it does take <clears throat> an extra heart of loving boldly. And that heart came to me in a weird, weird way. Uh, it's not natural to have that kind of a heart. And so uh, for me, uh, I had just the opposite. I was attending uh, Sam Houston State University in Huntsville, Texas, and was a student there. And some of my fellow students said, ah, we have a, a night job at the prison, sitting on a gun tower. It's a piece of cake. You just sit there, it's dark all night long, and then, you know, you make some decent money. And so I, I did that. I uh, started uh, working, started working at uh, the state penitentiary. And I, sure enough, started working on the gun tower uh, at night. And that did not last very long. And then I, the next thing I know, I was working in, uh, in the cell blocks and inside the cell blocks, uh, oh my. <clears throat> it was just very few months before, I thought I was a tough guy, 20-year-old. Uh, I thought I was a real tough guy, but found out real quick <clears throat> I was a wimp. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, the um, goodness sakes. Uh, if you can imagine uh, 
every whatever state you live in. You can imagine every one of the most violent, mean, hateful people in your state, put them all together under one roof. Uh, that's a hostile, horrible place. And then you, that's your job to go work there every day. So it's hard enough for those men that are in there to live amongst each other. Uh, it's a dog-eat-dog -dog, uh, survival of the fittest atmosphere that's very bloody and very violent. And so I found myself in that as a young man. And the biggest denominator here is I was not a believer. And so my heart was easily molded and shaped, and it was shaped in the wrong direction. I became a product of that prison environment, and uh, it was a very, very violent place. I became a very violent person. Uh, my buddies, uh, to survive, they were all tougher than me, so I uh, pumped iron every day, and I did that for 12 years. Every day for 12 years, ran wind sprints, and, the, <clears throat> and I depended on my own strength and speed and the, my own buddies, uh, all of us to survive. And for us, we considered it a daily war, a daily battle of us against the inmates, and many times it was. And so uh, there were days when uh, shift turnout happened and uh, not all of us went home. And so it, uh, it is, to a degree, a war in there, and I became a product of that. I became a very hateful, mean, cold-hearted person. And uh, I hated inmates. My daily, I not only didn't mind fighting, but I enjoyed fighting. Hmm. And the more brutal and the more violent it was, the more I enjoyed it. Uh, it just made me pump iron more and run wind sprints more. And, and so I, that's the kind of person that I was. And, uh, and so uh, not, not exactly the protocol for uh, what I later today, I am the pastor of care and compassion at my church. Uh, but, uh, but by the grace of God, uh, I, was, uh, I was in prison and actually my supervisors liked me. I was extremely aggressive and I was, you just, you lose all fear of things that a normal healthy person should fear. You run right into the midst of kind of like the 9-11 firemen and police officers. Uh, when inmates are fighting with knives and stuff, you just run right into the middle of it. Uh, and, and so that was life. And I, uh, so I was so mean and so cold hearted that the prison liked that and they promoted me. And so uh, it was supposed to be just a temporary job until I got out of college. Uh, but I ended up uh, staying there for 21 years and eventually retired from that career. But uh, I became more and more a product of that environment. And so they promoted me, first as a supervisor, and then as a lieutenant, and then as a captain. And then I became a, a judge over our internal court system. And that internal court system uh, was created by the federal government, um, a system that, to where we handle uh, our own, the crimes committed inside the prison, uh, we hold court on them ourselves uh, to save the free world courts uh, to, from being bogged down with the intense number of cases, that constant, constant crime in prison. And so I did that for my final 13 years in prison. I was a judge for our internal court system, and that brought with it appointment to the capital punishment squad. And so I was a member of the death squad. Uh, I personally participated in and helped with over 150 inmate executions. Wow. And so it uh, wasn't exactly what I thought I was getting into as a part-time job as a college student, but um, it uh, absorbed my life and shaped my heart. And um, I, uh, again, I was uh, very, uh, this love boldly could not be farther from my heart. I hated boldly, intently. I hated boldly and I didn't regret any of it. Uh, and, and then that caught up with me. Um, even, it's a strange thing here, uh, I, a friend of mine uh, introduced me to the gospel at one point. And um, by God's grace, um, God broke through that thick, 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 thick armor around my heart, a shell around my heart. And he, he challenged me um, to read the word. He asked me if I was a Christian, and I said, I suppose so. And I said, I, uh, uh, but I don't believe in the Bible. 
uh, you know, I said, I, I suppose Jesus is real, but the Bible's filled full of fairy tales. Don't believe in, you know, Adam and Eve, Noah's Ark, Jonah and the whale, or anything else in there, but I suppose Jesus is true. And this guy told me, he said, Jesus talked about Adam and Eve, Noah's Ark, Jonah and the whale, all those things, and so you can't believe in him without, he said, just, just go home and read just a little bit out of the Gospel of Matthew. He gave me a Bible, and I did that. And God grabbed my heart through the Gospel. And so the Gospel broke my heart and changed my life, and then I had a big problem, a big problem, because in prison we hated people that loved Jesus. And so prison ministers, we hated prison ministers. We, uh, we thought they were the most vulnerable, vulnerable, uh, you know, people that somebody had sold them a line and they had compassion on these uh, goofballs. And so we called prison ministers hug-a-thugs. Uh, we hated them. We hated prison ministers. And now here I am going back to work and now I'm a hug-a-thug. What am I going to do? You know, I'm worthless to the prison anymore. And so I was a huge struggle for me. I struggled and struggled. Ooh, ooh. And I, I've, I lost that struggle for a long time. I was still a very violent person. And, and uh, I, I, I believe the gospel, but I didn't live the gospel very well. And so one day I uh, went to one of my criminal justice professors at Sam Houston State University. His name was Dr. George Beto. And Dr. Beto, uh, I asked him, I said, I've, I guess I got to quit. I said, I, I want to be a Christian and I, I can't. Uh, prison is impossible. And so he told me, he said, you're, uh, he told me about law and gospel. I'd never heard of that before. And he said, you're awesome at law. You're horrible at gospel. And he said, um, go back to work. And he said, um, dig into God's word and don't uh, just pick and choose what you want out of the word. Start to uh, consider the gospel. He said, God loves those inmates every bit as much as he loves you. He sent his own son to die on the cross for those inmates uh, every bit as much as he died for you. So he said, never, ever forget that. And he said, you can struggle all you want as long as your struggle drives you into the word and as long as you read and hear the gospel. And so uh, I did that. And uh, I drew closer and closer to the Lord uh, to the point to where by the time I retired from prison, uh, I went to seminary. And um, so that concept, uh, you know, of and I, some of the statistics that were given last night uh, by President Harrison, I guess I'm one of those statistics, uh, an adult convert. Uh, I hadn't, didn't know what in the heck a Lutheran was or an LCMS Lutheran was, but Dr. George Vito was one of those. And so I found out what church he went to. I went to that church. And I figured if he could do it, somehow maybe what, something's in that church that I need. And so uh, sure enough, um, that was 30-something years ago, 35 years ago, and I've been an LCMS Lutheran ever since. I uh, went to uh, LCMS uh, seminary, and uh, now I serve as a care pastor uh, for Salem Lutheran Church, and now I'm back in prison. I am visiting uh, people in jails and prisons and hospitals every day. So uh, loving boldly uh, doesn't come naturally to anybody. It certainly didn't come naturally to me. My hat's off to anybody that uh, God has enabled to do that. Thank you, Tim, and thank all three of you for your transparency. And in some ways, all three of you are on front line kind of stuff. I have some specific questions that I heard from your presentations. We're going to kind of put those to the side to begin with. I'm just going to ask a couple of questions for you to share with our guests. Paul says that God's strength is made perfect in weakness. So can you talk a little bit about that from both, both, both the, your own experience and the experience of those you serve? So were there times you saw weakness in the people you served in which God's strength could be inserted? And are there times when you have felt so weak that it was a time when you knew God was taking over? So 
Uh, Tim, I'm going to ask you to start with that, and, and then Megan or David, whichever one of you wants to go next, but we'd like to hear from all three of you on this as you share with us, please. About the weakness? Yes. Um, well, there is a, the weakness for both the people that you're trying to love boldly and yourself is huge on both sides. Um, you know, it was, it was in my face this morning just walking down the streets in front of the hotel here. You can't walk two blocks in New Orleans down here without walking around hundreds of homeless people. And, uh, and so it was like one of the speakers was saying uh, this morning and last night, you know, you would consider them unclean and all that. And all that. That's a weakness uh, for us. We would consider those people less than us or something. Uh, and so that's our weakness. Their weakness is is that they, um, they, need, they need the gospel. And so from a prison background, I heard uh, one uh, prison ministry speaker at a prison rally one time saying that the prisons would be mostly emptied if somehow these men could hear and believe the words, four words, uh, your sins are forgiven. If they could somehow believe that, uh, they uh, wouldn't have that weakness. They would somehow have the boldness to receive love. But in my world of prison, uh, inmates, they don't, uh, they consider themselves unlovable. Mm -hmm. And so uh, trying to be a prison minister and reach them uh, is like, uh, you know, oil and water. It just repels off of them because they don't believe that they're lovable. That's their weakness. Our weakness is to be able to uh, see them as Dr. Beto counseled me to, to see them as someone that's, um, that God loves as much as me. And so but weakness in both ways. Um, for me, one of my great passions is to work with church workers like yourself. Um, and it's the piece about care for the caregiver. You guys are caregivers, and I'm a caregiver. And the tendency of caregivers is to not care for yourself. And that leads to burnout and stress. And um, probably about two years ago, our city had a lot of violent things take place in Orlando. And I just had a lot of people who I were already seeing involved in a lot of that. And I came to this point for myself that I, I was becoming burned out. We call it compassion fatigue. And I sought counseling for myself, worked really to support myself with a team of people, of other therapists and clinicians, and then my church and my husband, just so that I can have that support too. And, and I always wanna be encouraging pastors and leaders in our churches to take care of yourself. So easy to put ourselves on the back burner. Um, it's so easy when somebody's crisis is bigger than your own to not focus on what's going on, on inside of you. And I feel like it's so important to lead by example, be vocal about how you take care of yourself, be vocal about the support you put in place for yourself so that you can be a leader in that way too. So when you love yourself boldly and you're checked into God's mission and God's love for you, you are a much, much better caregiver. Thank you. Because I was uh, already thinking in the lines of, uh, of when I was weakest was when I just felt like I'm working all the time. Because when you're a chaplain and you're in garrison, by the, that, I mean, like back in the United States or back at your home base, it is still not a, a regular hours job. You've, they're really early or they're really late. Well, then at Camp Pendleton, California, they bring the Marine recruits up for their weapons training. And while they're at Camp Pendleton, uh, there are services on Sunday morning, but it's totally voluntary on the chaplains to lead that worship. And I realized that if I didn't get up and go lead that worship service for those recruits, there would not be a Lutheran service. And to make matters worse, they moved the time from 7.30 to 7 in the morning. Mm -hmm. So you're getting up super early. And I'm thinking, how is this taking care of myself? But then I went and I led the service. Sometimes you'd have 80, sometimes you'd have 12. But you'd look around that room and realize that these young men, and it was just men at uh, the service I'd led, because the 
female Marines train on the East Coast, were all the product of Lutheran homes, and Lutheran pastors, and volunteer Sunday school teachers, and they came there so grateful to have a break from their drill sergeant. <laughs> Some peace and quiet, and they would say to me, chaplain, this is what I know. This is church today. This is great. And they were just so grateful. And I was just drawing the energy right off of them. And it was knowing that folks like you were back there expecting that we sent Johnny off into the Marine Corps. Somebody will take care of him. I knew I had to be there. I had to be there. And instead of sapping energy out of me, it mm. gave me more energy. And one of the coolest things that ever happened, it really sealed the deal on this for me, it was after worship one su uh, Sunday morning, it's early, and they don't want to go back to their drill sergeant. Yeah, I said, just stay here, do whatever you need to do, come talk to me, uh, you don't need to go back yet. One of the recruits asked me, is it okay if I play the piano? I go, sure. And he went over and got behind the keyboard, and by heart, not opening a hymnal, played, let all mortal flesh keep silent. Oh, boy. Where do we get such men? You, did, you made it happen. Thank you. So sometimes when we think that, that we're strong and we can do it, that's when we're at our weakest. And when we acknowledge it's not us, mm -hmm. that's when God works. So what, the three of you were in situations where there was stress and difficulty and, and just awful, awful stories. How do you keep from becoming callous to that? How do you keep from becoming desensitized to the pain and people and just not really understand and just kind of deal with them and move on? How do you, how do you, how do you maintain compassion for each individual? And Megan, why don't you take that first? I watch sports. I get out of that setting sometimes. I coach basketball, I um, walk the dog. I, but I think that there's times where I have to go back to being who I am, like who, who I am as Megan, not as the counselor. Um, I was taught an activity that's been very helpful for me in the work that I do. Uh, and, and I think it's true for you too is, I don't get to see a beginning, an end. Mm. Uh, we don't get to tie a bow on it and it be done, right? People are always growing and continuing to grow. And so a lot of times somebody will come in maybe suicidal and I need to hospitalize them and then I don't know what happens after that. Um, Mary Jacob used to serve with us at Lutheran Counseling Services and she's a nurse practitioner and she taught me this activity she would do when I was getting very frustrated. She said, Megan, at night, I take the dog on the walk, <clears throat> and at every house I pass, I mentally envision my clients for that day, and I put them in there, and I envision them in a safe environment, eating dinner with their families, tucked into bed, and I walk on to the next house, and I do the next thing. Because I think that's what eats at me the most is what happens outside of the counseling setting, um, what decisions they make or what's the next place they take in their life, which is not of me to determine. It's not about me. But it is about kind of knowing um, that there's good things, that people grow and they change and they can overcome obstacles. Um, and then plugging into things that fill me up, like uh, UCF football. Hmm. So things like that. Um, actually, as you were saying that, uh, growing callous, it seems kind of natural to me and us. <clears throat> and so I, my answer to that is only by the grace of God and only by constantly hearing his word uh, do we some, are we somehow enabled to escape the callousness that's natural to us. And so God always did that during my career in prison and now Eve, uh, now, uh, I run into these situations to where you eh, don't have a clue, don't have a clue walking into a prison or walking into a hospital room. You don't have nothing, don't know what to say. And, uh, but by God's design, uh, it always seems like whatever my senior pastor preached on yesterday is exactly what I needed, you know? And so, uh, 
so callous, it's easy to get callous uh, thinking that, goodness sakes, I'm wasting my time. This uh, criminal is so hard-hearted, you know, and one in a million seem to uh, receive God's grace. The rest of them reject it. But, um, but maybe my senior pastor might have just been preaching on, uh, but God leaves the 99 to go after the one. And so I, somehow I escape callousness enough to represent God one more day. Uh, I have to have my daily devotion. I have to have my private time to get into the Word, to pray, read something from Christian history. <clears throat> and then I would love to sit down and talk with another chaplain, just plop down on, the, on, on their sofa and say, this is what I read today, and you know, this is where this is going in my head. And, and uh, that would usually open up a conversation where he or she needed to unload as well. So I think it was that mutual consolation that really helped me. Thank you. Are there, are there times when, when the task seems so daunting that y you wonder what's the point of even trying, that there's just so much, so many needs, so many hurts? What keeps you going when the whole thing looks overwhelming? Are there times when it does look overwhelming to you? <clears throat> I think for me there's times, especially working with kids, that they're in a, they're in a family setting that's not going to change. It, you're not going to get um, the parent to not be neglectful or um, the single mom to be home at night. Like, it's just not going to happen. And so it is about focusing on teaching that child how to take care of themselves, grow up sooner than they need to grow up, have coping skills. Um, and so sometimes when I walk into a session and I think, oh, these are my goals, this parent's going to change and this is going to be better for this kid, you have to pull back and say, it's not about your goals, Megan, it's about what this child needs or what this person needs. And if you look at the big picture sometimes, it's, it seems daunting. But when I, like I said, can jump in that canoe and just see that child's environment and and maybe teach them something within them that's gonna help them lifelong. When you narrow the scope, I think sometimes it's achievable and it brings hope. Uh, thanks. Yeah, that question about daunting reminds me of my conversation, counsel I got from Dr. George Beto. Um, and I was telling him, you know, that how can you live amongst, you know, all those inmates and, and love them, you know? And he quoted to me something that has been the number one scripture, the lens through which I see life ever since that moment. Uh, Matthew 10, 60. Uh, Jesus said, I send you out as sheep among wolves. Hmm. He said, so you must be shrewd as a serpent, yet gentle as a dove. And so Dr. Beto told me, you're awesome at being shrewd as a serpent. <laughs> you're horrible at being gentle as a dove. All law, no gospel. And so he says it's, it's always going to be daunting until, and so, and just in case uh, Max was going to ask a question that allowed such a thing, I brought a, uh, an illustration with me. And uh, this is something I keep in my office, and it comes in handy uh, for, as an illustration sometimes. And this is, for my purposes, is Jesus the Good Shepherd. In real life, I stole this from my nativity scene. <laughs> uh, but uh, for my purposes, for my purposes, this is Jesus the Good Shepherd. And I keep this uh, in my office, and I set it on one side. And on the other side of my office, I have mm. this. And this is the wolf. And so Matthew 10, 16, Dr. Beto, uh, help me to understand, I send you out as sheep among wolves. And so the wolves are real. And it's either Satan or somebody that Satan is influencing. And so he sends us out as a sheep among wolves. And Dr. Beto told me the only way you're going to survive, the only way that you're ever going to represent Jesus well is if this is you, if you live in the arms of Jesus, if you're constantly under his influence, you will represent him well. You'll become a product of that environment, Jesus' environment, not the environment of the wolves. And so I keep these in my office. Um, uh, 
as a reminder to me and as occasional uh, illustration for somebody I'm counseling that uh, it is, life's going to be daunting. Uh, but um, Jesus told us to do it. We can do it if we hang close to him. Could you repeat the question, please? <laughs> <laughs> I get Let me read it here. Stories of you. Um, when the whole thing over, seems overwhelming, when there's just so much, how do you keep from being inured to that? I think in, in the case of military chaplain, it's the fact that you're suffering with them and whatever they do, so nobody has it any worse. And as chaplain, you usually have it better because you can go anywhere you need to go. You can talk to whoever you need to talk to, the commanding officer, the admiral, or the lowest ranking uh, person there, the private. You can go at any space you need to go to. So if people are saying things are bad, you're saying, yeah, they are, but I still got it really good. And my purpose and reason for being here is to try to make it better for others. And so I always just kind of found my purpose and my bearing in that attitude at, in those times. Tim, great illustration of love boldly to be a sheep that goes to love a wolf. Mm -hmm. uh, powerful. So we're coming to, kind of to the end, and I have like a specific question for each of you. But this is kind of a general question again, and just kind of fly over it there's a lot of, we, we talk about comfort zones and we all have our comfort zone and there are those of us who have life, that, you know, it's pretty nice, pretty safe. Are, are there times when you get cynical about people who have things so easy compared to the people with whom you deal on a regular basis? I mean, yes, most definitely. Uh, I think more to the work that I do in schools, you know, if you have a child in your class and they can't sit still and they're, you know, always flirting out and they're jumping around and the teacher just wants them to listen and engage and behave, um, it's easy to say, you know, the other 18 kids can do it, why can't this one? Until you understand what's going on in that child or maybe in the home or things. It can be frustrating from my perspective working with a teacher that you don't, you don't understand. Like this child, you know, maybe he didn't, he only has one mom. She works, you know, the evening shift and he feeds his brother and sister dinner. Like he goes home and he has this weight of responsibility on him. And when he comes to school is the only time he gets to be a child. Like, why can't you understand that teacher? How can you, you know, so sometimes I get frustrated when we have these expectations of our kids to meet this norm, but we don't take the time to just actually understand all the other stresses that are taking place in their life. So I, for me, yes, I can get frustrated with that um, and overwhelmed and maybe even cynical to the point of um, they're just so unaware. Mm. And I wish that we could educate more about mental health needs um, and things like that. And, and so I'll go in my bubble and I'll, you know, moan and complain for a bit. And then usually my director will say, well, what are you going to do about it? Hmm. And so then we try to work to figure it out. Um, yes, uh, that's daily. I want to become cynical uh, towards people that don't love boldly. And all I've got to do is God will remind me real quickly that I uh, have struggled with that all my life. I still do. Uh, and I used to be the worst at it. Matter of fact, um, that's another right up there with Matthew 10, 16 is uh, 1 Timothy where Paul says, uh, I was the chief of sinners. Uh, yet God in his grace uh, showed compassion and mercy on me that I might be uh, an example of that God even loves wolves. Paul was a wolf and God loved even him. So yes, uh, natural is for me to be cynical. I get cynical and God rescues me from it. Yeah, there's times when you think that, okay, I've got it bad, but then you realize, no, I've got it good because I have this unique position to inject God's word into these situations. Let me just tell you a couple stories real quick about um, Afghanistan. Um, 
we were at a large camp and the adjoining camp was Camp Bastion, which had the field hospital. So when guys were wounded on the battlefront, they were brought there first for a trauma care and then stabilized. Sometimes that took a few days and then they were flown on, usually to Landstuhl, Germany. And uh, I would, I could kind of read on, on a um, video screen what was going on on the battlefront and you could kind of anticipate when it was time to get over to the hospital. Hmm. There was nothing more privileged from my perspective than being there when a troop came out of surgery and came out from under anesthesia. One guy I can't get, I'll never forget him, um, don't know what's happened to him, but he was just covered with the gauze and the bandages, hoses coming out of every uh, orifice, and uh, I don't know how much of him was still there, to be honest, but his eyes were open. And when they come in there, because they don't want to mix up medicines and treatments and all that, they're assigned a number. And so all these nurses and doctors and technicians who are working on them, even into the recovery room and in an ICU, don't know the name. They don't have the name of that Marine, that sailor, that soldier, whoever it is there and all that guys. And I'm looking into the eyes of this, this uh, turned out to be a Marine, and uh, I, I ask him, what's his name? Oh, we don't know. I refused to leave until they found out mm. what his real name was. And I'm comforting him because I can tell he's responding with his eyes and, and uh, assuring him that God loves him and that he's made it and uh, he's going to heal and trying to paint this picture of what God can do for him through all this medicine he's being given. And finally they came back. His name is Jedediah. Mm. And I start calling him by his name and his eyes wow. just lit up. <laughs> then this other Marine came, comes out of anesthesia. First thing he does is, oh. Oh. and he's all there. Oh. And praising God, oh. he just couldn't believe he made it off the battlefield and he was whole. He had like a, got shot here or something. I said, you're going to be fine. You're great. He goes, oh, praise God. And he's quoting a psalm. I can't remember which psalm it was. I'm bad chaplain. Um, <laughs> and that was like, to share that joy with someone that nobody else would share with a, a brother in Christ. Thank you. Thank sure. the three of you. We're, we're, we're at our end. So thank you for the, the three of you for being available to allow God to work through you and love boldly. Let's thank them. Please. Thank you.